Did you know that there's such a thing called a cyanoscope? A cyanoscope measures the blue of the sky. And on today, when there is such a perfect, clear, beautiful blue sky, let's go to our journals and indulge in the beauty of that blue and create our own cyanoscopes. All right, let's talk about the materials we're gonna need for today's exercise. You're gonna need some opaque paint, and that means that your marks are going to be thick enough that whatever might be underneath the page is no longer visible. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. You're going to want a paintbrush. I happen to prefer these flat shapes. They are going to automatically give you the sort of mark that you're gonna to need to build your cyanoscope. You're going to want to have a pencil, paper towel for cleaning your brush off, and a circular form. So this paper plate is what I'm going to use for my cyanoscope. The cyanoscope is a circular design. So I'm going to use this paper plate to both be that stencil that I need for the circle, as well as uh, my palette for mixing my colors. I have a spray bottle, because I'm working with acrylic paints and they may dry a little quickly, I may choose to use or need to use this to keep my paints wet. And off camera, I have some water. Now, the other thing I wanna talk about is the journal or the page that you're working on. I am going to build my cyanoscope over top of a page that already has some marks on it. In these journaling lessons, I've talked about the fact that a journaling page doesn't really ever have a clear beginning or a clear ending that they can be viewed as something that is always in flux or growing. And I wanna encourage you to think about that in your own way. So as you page through your book and you think about or look for a page that you wanna put your marks on, think about what's already there uh, and, and how those marks might influence or change or impact that page. For instance, adding blue to this page would be a really beautiful addition but so too would be just working on a plain page altogether. And I could choose to work on a piece of plain canvas, like what's here in this mixed media book, or I could just work on a plain piece of paper. And also think about what might end up on the page facing your design. I particularly like the idea of putting my cyanoscope or blue uh, design here on this page because there is a, a variety of blues over here on this facing page, and I think they might have a nice conversation together. So uh, I encourage you to go back to pages that you've already worked on that you might consider to have been finished and perhaps add your cyanoscope element to them. So let's get started first by putting our circular design or our cyanoscope design down on the page. Now, I wanna encourage you also to think about placement. You could place it so that it bridges a page spread. You could place it you know, at the bottom or the top or over on the side. There's different shaped books, there's different size circles. I am going to place mine roughly here, pretty even on the, uh, on the page. And I'm just going to trace with my pencil here the perimeter of my cyanoscope. And now I have my template created for the actual design itself. Now, what is a cyanoscope? A cyanoscope is basically a variety of color swatches arranged from lightest to darkest that fall inside the schematic or the color family of blue. Now you could choose to do your cyanoscope with cyan paint, or you could choose any other color. You don't even need to necessarily stick with the blue. Today, I'm gonna go with this blue, uh, with my primary cyan, but I'm, I also have a lighter, value or a lighter paint and a darker paint. And what I am going to do is create a variety of swatches around the perimeter of this circle that carry me 
from a very pale cyan, cyan to a very dark cyan. And that's going to give me my cyanoscope right there. All right. So I, again, I want to uh, reinforce the idea that if you are not working on a plain or a, a blank page, you are going to want to make sure that your paint is opaque so that it covers up what's underneath it. And we're going to start. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about value ranges because we are going from lightest light to darkest dark as part of this exercise. And we also need to determine a middle value or the exact middle of our lightest light and darkest dark. Let's bring in this value scale here that goes from lightest light to darkest dark. And somewhere right here in between these two uh, rectangles lies our middle value. And if we look at this paint, at, the, at this primary cyan paint, it actually is a darker, a darker value than the middle. So first off, we're gonna have to take whatever our, our color is, whatever the hue is that we're building the scope around, and we need to bring this hue to this middle value. So let's do that right now. I'm going to squeeze a little bit of this paint out and because I have to take it from a darker to a lighter, I'm going to have to add some of my lighter paint to that. So I'm going to add a little bit of this white here. And I'm just eyeballing this. I have no idea what value I'm gonna end up with here. It's such a pretty color, isn't it? So, and I, I wanna mix it pretty evenly. I don't want my colors to be super streaky for this particular page, although that could be a nice effect. It's not really what I'm going for here. I want, I want the attention to be on the gradation of the blue around the circle, around the scope, and not necessarily on the variance inside each of the brush marks. Okay, so I've got this pretty well mixed. And now what I'm gonna do is, um, you know, I decided to use this spatula here and I didn't list that in my list of materials, but you could use a palette knife for this if, if you have to do this, this, uh, 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 this step. If the color you choose it happens to already be a middle value, you don't even have to do this step. So I'm gonna take this blue and I'm gonna put it over here and I'm gonna squint down at it. You can't see me squinting down. But when you squint down at something, what it does is it, it reduces what you're looking at to a value. And if I squint down at this, what I'm looking for is a jump in value from the spatula to the colors around it. And I feel like this is just a tiny bit too light because I can still see an edge between the spatula and my value scale. So I'm gonna add some more blue to this and let's see what happens. And if this step intimidates you a little bit, that's okay, then just choose a different starting color that happens to be of a middle value, okay? I don't want to um, intimidate anyone from the get-go. If you're struggling with seeing color as value, that is nothing to be ashamed of. It took me, it's taken me 20 plus years to do that and I still struggle with it. It's, it's kind of a big step, so. Don't beat yourself up. You are where you are, and you can still enjoy this exercise if you're not seeing this blue as a value. Let's bring this back over here and look. I still feel like it's a little bit too light, so I'm gonna add some more. Notice I'm not making it darker with my dark tube. Um, because I really want the clarity or the saturation level of this color itself, of the root hue, to shine. Okay, I, we are there. So now what I want to do is I'm going to scrape all this into one pot. Actually, I'm going to mix some more of it because I can tell I don't think I have enough paint here. So please hold. I do love mixing paint. It makes me so happy to play with this product 
that is just really gives me joy on so many different levels. Just the texture of it, moving it about, seeing the reaction of, uh, or seeing how the surface changes when I put a mark down, thrills me. Okay, I have a good, healthy puddle of paint now. I shouldn't I shouldn't uh, run out of any. And don't worry if you end up mixing a nice big puddle of paint yourself. I'll show you a little tip at the end so that you don't have to waste it, okay? All right, yes, I just double checked my, my value there and it's spot on. So I'm gonna scrape all this paint over and sort of puddle it together. This is going to keep it from drying out because these are acrylic paints, they might dry out pretty quickly. All right, now I'm gonna pop the spatula in the water and I'm going to put some white paint down here. Now, let's get rid of this value range. I am going to start at the bottom center of this circle and I am going to bring my cyan, this medium value blue. I'm gonna put a mark of it here and then I'm going to carry it up this side of the circle. And with every mark that I make up the side of the circle, I'm going to add a tiny bit of white. And I'm gradually gonna carry that gradation up to the top of the circle. And once I get that lighter value range, and if I flip this over, you can actually, oh, it's off the picture frame, here. So I'm gonna start out here in the middle and I'm gonna go lighter up and around to the top on this side. And on this side, I'm gonna go darker and up to the top to my darkest dark on this side. So let's get started. Before we jump in, I wanna talk a little bit about a brush. So there's different shapes of brushes for different reasons. They make different kinds of marks. And because I'm going to be making an, a ring of blue marks that go around the perimeter of the circle, I have chosen a flat brush because that flat brush is already going to, if I, if I follow this edge that I've drawn, that flat brush is going to automatically create that inner ring for me. Um, I'm not gonna have to use like a little tiny brush and lots of little brushy brushy marks. So the size and the shape of the brush that you use can actually aid or lessen the amount of work that you have to do on your surface. If I wanted a very broad ring of color, I would use a wider brush. And if I wanted a narrow ring of color, I would use a skinnier brush. Now I have a, a middle range brush here, and this brush is a little, about a half an inch. So it is uh, not terribly big, but it's big enough that it's gonna create a really vibrantly colored rim here for me to work with. Now with acrylic paints, they're water-based. And one thing that we know is that the more water we add to the paint, the more transparent it becomes. And earlier on in the lesson, I spoke to the point of having the paint be really trans or really opaque. So I don't want to make it transparent. So I'm not going to use a whole lot of water here. I'm just off camera. I, I dipped my brush in the paint just to get it wet because that wetness is going to allow the, the paint itself to soak into the brush and give me a really beautiful mark. So another trick here is to load your brush up with just the amount of paint that you need. And if you can see, I very gently picked up just a tiny lip of paint here on both sides. And I'm gonna eyeball the center of my circle and I'm gonna put my mark down. I'm using hardly any pressure at all and I'm following that outer edge and I've just put a little square down. Now I'm gonna go and I'm gonna pick a little bit of this paint up again and I'm gonna pick up a tiny bit of white paint. You can see on my brush, hardly any paint, hardly any pressure. I'm not jamming my brush down into it. I'm using it very gently and I'm gonna to touch where I left off and create another lighter mark it goes right off of that and I'm just going to continue this process I'm going to pick up a tiny bit of white I'm going to come back over here pick this up touch and make my mark 
and I'm going to continue to do this. Now, if you are new to acrylic paints, if you are new to mixing with your brush, this may be a lot of decision-making happening here. How much do I load my brush up? How do I work it into the puddle? How do I make my mark? So it could take you a little bit of practice to get this quite right. And if you wish to, you can practice on an index card in a straight line. And I can tell already that I'm going light so quickly here that I may not be able to make it all the way up to the top of my... I may be too light by the time I get up to the top there. But the idea is that ultimately you want to end up with a trail of small brush marks that will gradually go from your mid value to your lightest light. Now, if you are working with craft paint, you will not be able to get these tiny little steps that I have. Craft paint has less pigment in it, and it's the quantity or the ratio of pigment to binder that allows you to mix these little nuanced steps. So craft paint, you're gonna have probably four or five variants between your mid value and your lightest light. A student grade paint will give you a little bit more than that. And a professional or an artist grade paint is gonna give you a lot more, significantly more. And I'm doing this pretty quickly for demo purposes. But I can tell you from experience that I know with these particular paints, I can get so careful with my steps, such tiny, tiny nuanced steps that you wouldn't even be able to see the brush edges between them. And that's, that's because I'm working with professional grade artist quality paints. I'm also noticing here that it's getting a little difficult for me from a um, gesture standpoint to make those marks. So I'm gonna rotate my book and just continue working. So pay attention to how your body feels as you make marks. And if you discover or start to feel like you're straining and it doesn't, it no longer feels like it's a natural extension of how your body moves. See what sorts of adjustments you can make. Not just when you're journaling, but when you're making art in general. There's something about the energy that travels down our arm and into the mark. And the more relaxed or natural we may feel as we're making these marks, the more natural, relaxed that energy is gonna travel into. You're really gonna be able to see that difference. There. So you can see here how I have created this lovely sort of a transition from a middle value of that, that blue up to a lightest light, okay? So now I'm gonna, I'm washing my brush and I am going to repeat this process over on this side, but now I need to add this Payne's Gray onto my plate. So I'm gonna put that over here and I'm gonna resist the urge to mix using this puddle here because this has white in it. And I don't want to make this darker by adding this Payne's Gray. 
I want to make this darker by adding the Payne's Gray. So I'm going to start a new little trailway over on the other side of my paper plate. And after I clean my brush, I am going to bring it to this paper towel and I'm laying the brush on, on the pa paper towel flat or in accordance with the direction of its bristles. I'm gonna gently, oh, gently fold this towel over and it, to reinforce the shape of the brush as well as to just sort of gently squeeze out the excess water. Okay, so my bristles are all still reinforced in that shape and that, and that shape that's naturally giving us the marks that we want. And it's still a little bit wet. And knowing how my gesture moves or how, how, my, how my hand prefers to paint, I'm gonna rotate my book so that I'm not fighting against that natural inclination. Another, uh, another tip, if, if you're mixing and working on a painting, really what you wanna do is, if you're right-handed, you wanna mix on the right-hand side of your artwork so you're not having to drag your brush across. The, the previous session, I wasn't really uh, demonstrating a nice or appropriate kind of um, format in order for you to work uh, because I was setting a poor example by dragging my brush across. But that that working this way minimizes any dripping or um, other sort of accidental brush mark that might happen during the process. Now I know I have this blue mark down here again, but I'm just gonna make a new one. And I'm gonna pick up a tiny bit of that blue, that Prussian, or no, it's Payne's Gray, not Prussian. And I'm gonna put it in here and I'm gonna just, my brush feels a little bit dry. So I'm gonna pick up a tiny bit of water here. It could be dry because my paint is starting to dry naturally. I think I probably grabbed too much. Oh. And you'll notice too that even though these tubes of paint are the same company, the viscosity feels a little different. The white felt looser. This blue, feel, this Prussian, ah, I keep calling it Prussian, the paint's gray. It feels drier. That could be a nature of the pigment itself, or maybe the tube of paint is a little bit older. So in order to get the kind of marks that I want, I may have to alter Add, pick up a little bit more moisture, load a little bit more paint onto my brush. That's too big of a jump. So we'll pick some of that root color back up again. This is a fantastic exercise that will help you practice how to load your brush and how to make very precise mixtures. Lots of There's lots of good baby stepping that happens here. And while this is for a fun sort of exercise or fun result, it's also practicing a great skill or technique that you can use in your artwork. See, this, that's a big value jump right there between those two. So I'm gonna go back and soften that a little bit. When I, when I uh, traveled to teach workshops years ago, this was an exercise that I would have my students do not as a circle with one color, but as a color wheel or color triangle with the three primaries. And each point would be a different primary and they would move from, let's say their yellow to their blue and they would get all those different greens, all the little variant steps of green between those two primaries. I loved doing that exercise with them. Now an actual cyanoscope is done in a portable way, not in a bound book. With this outer edge, it's, it's an actual circle. So the color goes directly 
to that outer edge. And then the um, scientists can actually measure the color of the sky, find the placement of the color on the sky against all of the swatches they have around the perimeter. I think it's a pretty interesting tool from back in the time frame when there were limited scientific means to examine the weather. Sailors had all sorts of different apparatus or things at their uh, leisure that they could use to help guide them. I think that that jump might have been just a tiny bit too much. Help guide them as they determined proper sailing conditions and whatnot. Now on screen, these uh, shifts may not, you may not be able to see the subtle variation between them just because of how the camera films. And I think I'm actually about as dark as I'm going to get. So I didn't quite, I was unable to stretch it all the way up. But I feel like I got a good approximation of this. It's close enough for my needs. And isn't it beautiful the way this color just gently sort of reaches towards a brighter, lighter sky? And here it moves towards a tonal, darker, moodier, maybe even a calm night. I love the way it plays off of what's underneath it as well. I think that's a really interesting collision. Now we've done this and we happen to have a good amount of paint left over here. So I'm going to show you how you can go about using this in another way. So because that page is wet, I don't want to close that journal or potentially turn the page and work on other spreads because that would impact the paint in that, the wet paint in that journal. But what I'm going to show you here is another journal that I have. Uh, th this is called a, an accordion journal or a concertina book. And the beautiful thing about this book is that the pages are one big continuous piece of paper. So I could stretch this out. Um, I don't even know. I haven't stretched this one out. It's full length. Uh, but this is an eight by 10 book just so that you have, um, you have a sense of how large it is. And one of the things that I love to do, or, or one of the, the whole reason that I have these books in my studio is that I use them for leftover paint. And I also use them to audition different types of mark making or different tools and things like, for instance, here, I'm experimenting with some water-soluble media and a piece of tape and sort of just playing with the kinds of lines or edges that I can make. But this is a way for me to take leftover paint and still use it and learn from it because I really hate to throw anything out. So I have um, this paper plate here and it's got some... Um, it's got some paint on it, so let's use that. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna paint with this spatula here just because I can. Uh, it makes a really interesting mark compared to a paintbrush. And one of the things that I really like to do, particularly in my paintings, is explore other ways that I can get my paint or my product onto the surface. I really like unexpected things. And so having a space like this where I can play with those ideas or really just sort of experiment is really informative to my painting practice. So as I'm laying this down, I'm thinking about differences. This paint is really nice and thick. And this paint feels kind of dry brushy, doesn't it? And if I pick up some of this white paint, and I go into this and I mix it right on the surface, I can get some really cool stuff happening. Let's pick up some more. So 
So this is this is a journal where I play with my paint and different color palette options and mark making sorts of things. But you could also use this just as a space to practice or experiment or build backgrounds for future journal pages. Remember how I said that you know, a page is always in flux or never necessarily finished. So you could always take your leftover paint and your journal and just put color down on the page just because. Uh, and, and you don't ever have to feel like you're gonna resolve it because there is the intention to come back at another point in time and add more marks. And I have a good amount of blue, so still. So let's let's add some blue here. Isn't this interesting? This edge between this spread and this one. I find that that edge is kind of it feels important to me. And let's let's sort of see if we can't build a connection between these two pages and preserve that edge, but by bringing this blue over here, now we've got this great, great sort of connection that's floating. Let's put a little bit of it up here from one page to the next. And now I haven't wasted my paint. I haven't had to throw it away. I've learned a little bit about differences and creating a conversation with different kinds of marks. And I've also created this super cool cyanoscope. Thanks for journaling with me. I can't wait to see what you create with this exercise. Please, if you do share your work on social media, feel free to tag, ah, to hashtag it with art so journaling. And I'll have an opportunity to see what you have made. Thanks so much for being a part of my own creative journey. And I really hope that you enjoyed this time with me and my journal. Happy cyanoscope making.